been a, a really interesting series of papers so far this morning. Um, what I want to do in this short uh, time is just to reflect on a conversation, both the kind of general conversation that um, I think archaeology and poetry have been having for much longer than we generally realize, but also a much more specific conversation, which is one which I had um, with uh, a PhD student in the Faculty of English uh, when I was in Cambridge doing my own PhD as well, um, in which we tried to think about how the language of literary studies could help archaeology and could um, change perhaps some of the ways that we think about burials. Um, and ultimately, it was a kind of a failed conversation because we both pulled in different directions. Um, but I think there are interesting things to reflect on and interesting things um, to, to learn from it. Um, I'm not going to speak specifically about the bog, but as an Irish person, um, as you've already seen today, uh, poetry and bog are kind of intimately connected and interwoven. Um, so you're going to see several images uh, coming up as we go through. Um, and here's another one. Um, so as I say, there's this kind of ongoing conversation which has happened uh, metaphorically in a sense, um, in that archaeology and poetry often share a kind of language um, without ultimately acknowledging it. Um, and in, in poetry and in English more generally, there are these notions of discovery which archaeology taps into. Um, and you see that in the excitement that kind of news stories about archaeology generate as well. But metaphors of excavating, of layers, of secrets are, are very common. Um, but we also have metaphors for poetry uh, that we use in archaeology all the time. We talk about landscapes or burials that speak. We talk about reading the past. Um, and at one point in time, we talked about that very intensely. Um, but still, we use the metaphor all the time. Um, and we talk about translating as well and using things in different zones. But it's, it's an uneasy alliance, as my conversation with a literary theorist kind of reveals, um, because we want those things to go in different ways. And we don't always want to accept the full baggage of taking on that other discipline. Um, so when Seamus Heaney was interviewed by Christine Finn um, for her book on archaeology and poetry, uh, he was surprised to learn that he was seen as a kind of an archaeological poet. And he didn't kind of accept that uh, for himself, um, which is kind of interesting. So thinking about burials, um, and burials as things that speak, um, or things that can be read, um, as we might say, um, just to lay a kind of a groundwork of, of where I'm going. Um, burials are things which are carefully composed and staged. Um, they are something which uh, is kind of a managed uh, putting together of bodies and objects in a particular way. Uh, so there's something which people think about. They think about the kind of impacts they're going to have, think about what is appropriate to be placed in particular ways. They're also kind of emotionally fraught. Uh, and sometimes we're cautioned to remember that not everybody doing a burial might be sad, um, but they will have emotions of various kinds. So it's a kind of a, an, an event staging that is rich in emotional potential um, and different emotions for different people. Uh, and those are emotions that are given a kind of solid and lasting form that have an impact on the people who are there, the people who are around them, and also have an impact on the people who then come to excavate them later in time uh, and try and interpret them. Um, and, and this quote from, from Yeats, which I'm not going to read out because I'm not a poet or able to read poetry well, but it, it speaks to the idea that in burying somebody, in putting somebody into the ground, what you actually do is you restore them in the memory and in the minds of the people who are gathered around or the people who hear about it later. Um, and that's what happens when we come to excavate them later as well. So burials are events where actions are redolent with meaning. Burials are things which speak, and we say that metaphorically, to the people gathered and to us as well. Um, so it's perhaps inevitable that archaeologists at some point start to thought about, think about how to read those burials, and specifically how to read them as poetry. Um, and so how this fits into the into kind of the initial post-processual moves has already been discussed a little bit today. Um, so I won't say too much about it, other than to say specifically with, with burials, um, there was a conversation about how they are structured as if, as if they are a language, 
and they have a kind of a grammar, and it's made most specific in the work of Martin Carver, looking at Sutton Hu, where he argues that um, a burial is a kind of poem, and in fact it is a kind of poem that can be read. Um, and he uses this, this biblical quote to say it can be read through a glass darkly, which I think means that it's kind of hard to read and hard to work out what exactly they're trying to say. Um, and it's also important to note that burials at the time that they happen are also likely to be poetic events uh, in that people speak or make kind of poetic declarations at the graveside. Poetic language is wrapped up in the way that people do burying as well as the way that they come um, to mean something in, in the present when we excavate them. But it is very complicated because it's also wrapped up with the, the inexpressible. Um, because poetry relies heavily on context. Um, and when we talk about burials, we're largely lacking the glossary. We're not able to work out exactly what um, certain things mean. We're also missing large parts of the poem if a burial is to be a, is to be a poem. Because obviously we lose all kinds of organic material most of the time. We lose a lot of the content that we might want to talk about. So if there has been a speech act in the past, we only have part of it. That's a little bit difficult, like working with the works of Sappho or something like that and just being conti continuously confused. Um, I also find it curious that um, when we talk about burial speaking and we talk about um, interpreting burials in the present, they often speak like capitalists. Um, and Martin Carver's work on Sutton Who focused on that because it's such a rich and evocative burial, um, and liken that to a kind of great work of literature. And he has this quote in that piece, which um, effectively says that some actions mean more than others. And sometimes people are thinking more strongly um, when they're doing burying than at other times, which are more of a kind of an afterthought, which I think doesn't account for the inexpressible here. Um, so all of this is just to say it's difficult to read the meaning of a burial but perhaps that's okay and we don't really need to because instead we can use this other language from literary theory and talk about the poetics of a burial. So burials aren't actually poems and they can't actually be read, much to my disappointment five years ago when I tried to do that. Um, but that's not to say that there's nothing in this metaphor whatsoever because burials do have this curious kind of way of condensing the world, this curious kind of way of being emotionally fraught. Um, so we can talk instead about the poetics of the burial, and that is how that burial has meaning, um, and how that meaning is enacted for the people who are gathered to make a burial, and for us as archaeologists in the present. Um, and in order to do that, when I was talking to this literary theorist, um, we talked about um, theories uh, surrounding lyric poetry. So lyric poetry is... Um, to my uneducated mind, most poetry. Um, it is poetry that has a kind of imagined voice that is speaking. So you can think of Wordsworth who says, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Um, and there's a voice that's speaking out of that poem to us. Um, and you see here just from, from one of these book covers how that is linked in literary theorists' minds to ideas of archaeology as well. Um, but a really interesting book that we drew upon at the time was the work of Jonathan Culler. Um, who talks about the theory of the lyric um, and three components that we drew out of it, um, which I think are useful for archaeologists in general, though I'll focus just on one. The first one was to talk about how lyric poetry has kinds of formal devices and patterns, um, and that gives it some of its power, or playing with those give it, gives the poetry some of its power. Uh, and we can think about how burials at different time periods have forms that they return to, and when those forms vary, that has particular meanings that are contextual. So not all of the context is missing for us, and sometimes those formal devices are helpful for interpreting them. Secondly, Culler talks about triangulated address, which is the idea that poems do speak, or lyric poems do speak, um, and have a voice. Uh, and we think we're hearing the voice of Wordsworth, or whoever it is, um, but actually we're hearing our own ventriloquizing because we're reading out that poem. And so we're hearing through a kind of um, inflected voice and hearing through our own voice. Um, and that was where the literary theorists really wanted to go looking at archaeological reports and the way that we talk about um, 
talk about people in the past and tr triangulated address can describe our own ventriloquizing in those actions. Um, and the third notion is the idea of iterability, which is what I'm going to talk about um, for, I think, another two slides, um, which is the idea that poems iterate. And every time you reread a poem, it is effectively a reperformance. Um, it's something which is new, but also the same. And you're returning to, um, to, to similar ground, but something will have changed and something will be different. Cool. We can think about iterating burials then. And think of burials themselves as reperformances. And so Culler has this really nice phrase in that book where he talks about poems being haunted by the rhythms of other poems. And I think that captures a nice way um, of that we can understand burials as returning to places, returning to um, forms of action that have happened before, but are happening in a different context for a different person, um, and so might be happening slightly differently. But they are connected through the bodily actions of digging, through whatever poetic invocations at the graveside, through whatever ways of remembering, so that in some sense, burials blur into one another in the minds of the people who are doing them, because they're the physical actions that they return to, the spaces they return to, all of those kinds of things. And that's partly what gives places like Bronze Age Barrows their power, is that blurring between people, is that um, return to um, the rhythms of other burials. But we can also think about archaeology as iteration and as redoing, um, and which is something which I thought about when I was working in field archaeology, particularly because there you are spending a lot of your time redigging pits that someone has dug in the past in order to find often not very much in them, and it's frustrating. Um, but archaeology is about returning to places and actions and effectively repeating them. So when we engage with burials, we dig the grave cut again, um, and we try and get it as close to being exactly what was dug before. Um, so in a sense, we're returning to actions, we're iterating over those, um, those past actions, and we are, in a sense, haunted by the rhythms of those, those past actions. And I think what all of this can do as well as giving us some nice kind of language to talk about, is to encourage us to sit with ambiguity and to embrace ambiguity in our interpretive practices. Because there is a tendency when we talk about burials to try and interpret their literal meaning and try and interpret society from them. But actually, poetics reminds us that although meaning existed, we don't always need to recover it. And we can still have interesting things to say without reconstructing the full meaning. We can still talk about the ways in which burials have power, the ways in which people interact um, with these settings. So I think that's a kind of a productive power in not understanding and encourages us to open out our interpretations and have multiple interpretations, getting us closer to the kind of radical alterity that we might promise when it comes to being able to talk about the past. Um, things which are very different. So it's a way of, of saying, let's disrupt things um, and let's tear down the kind of artifices of the capitalist burial, but we need not actually construct something um, to replace it. We can have multiple different ways of sitting with burials and sitting with ambiguity. Um, and so that leads us ultimately to a, a poetics of, of iteration um, in which I think that we can attune to how these things happen again. Um, and we can draw, we don't have to draw on literary theory um, to, in order to do this. So I came to this discussion through that conversation with a literary theorist. But those of you who know Deleuze's work on difference and repetition will see that there's different ways that you can talk about similar things through that. Um, but the idea that rhythms mark the way that human human lives happen. Um, so in the past, we can talk about seasonal, ritual, cosmological rhythms. And those are similar rhythms or different rhythms that structure our, our own ways of living as well. Um, so that by returning to places, returning to actions, um, differences made manifest in those, those particular interactions. Things are either different or they're the same. Um, and that's what is giving them particular powers or powers to do different things. Um, and so then I end with a question, which is, do our texts, our archaeological texts, actually allow us to explore that? 
And I don't think they do, because generally we try and find the answer, and we try and cut down all those other possibilities rather than living with those rhythms and living with that ambiguity. Um, so that's roughly where I've got to with this conversation that didn't go anywhere. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much for listening.